Admiral Byrd goes down there, Operation High Jump, 1946 through 47, and Operation Deep Freeze, 1955 through 56. Then he dies on March 11th, 1957. Um, then the Antarctic Treaty takes place shortly after uh, his death. We see that the main treaty was open for signature on December 1st, 1959, and officially entered into force on June 23rd, 1961. Meanwhile, okay, let's put the chronology here. You got, uh, again, Operation High Jump 46 through 47, Operation Deep Freeze 55 to 56. He dies in 57. NASA's formed in 1958. Then, uh, after Operation Deep Freeze and whatever weirdness took place down there, everybody leaves there, leaves Antarctica, and they go and form this Antarctic Treaty and put that into place in 1961. Uh, the original signatories were the 12 countries active in Antarctica during the International Geophysical Year 1957-58. The 12 countries that had significant interests in Antarctica at the time were Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, the Soviet Union, the, the United Kingdom, and of course the United States. These countries had established over 50 Antarctic stations for the International Geophysical Year. The treaty was a diplomatic expression of the operational and scientific cooperation that had been achieved on the ice. Something happened down there after Operation Deep Freeze, and presumably about the time that Admiral Byrd died. So all these nations that I just talked about here, they, they leave there, they come back, they sign this Antarctic Treaty. At the same time, NASA is formed. And, and right away, they, the United States and Russia start launching high-altitude nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. Now, I, I can see why the cons the people will put on a conspiracy hat at this point because it get, if they're trying to avoid a conspiracy, they're not helping with the names. You've heard me say it before. I'm going to say it again. You know, you got Operation High Jump, Oper Operation Deep Freeze. NASA's formed. They signed this Antarctic Treaty. And then when you look at the high altitude nuclear bomb tests that begin uh, here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read Operation Dominic here. Operation Dominic was a series of 31 nuclear test explosions with a 38.1 megaton total yield conducted in 1962 by the United States in the Pacific. This test series was scheduled quickly in order to respond in kind to the Soviet resumption of testing after the tacit 1958-61 test moratorium. Most of these shots were conducted with free-fall bombs dropped from B-52 bomber aircraft. 20 of these shots were to test new weapons designs, six to test weapons effects, and several shots to confirm the reliability of existing weapons. The Thor missile was also used to lift warheads into near space to conduct high altitude nuclear explosion tests. These shots were collectively called Operation Fishbowl. 
Operation Dominic occurred during a period of high Cold War tension between the United States and the Soviet Union since the Cuban Bay of Pigs invasion had occurred not long before. Nikita Khrushchev announced the end of a three-year moratorium on nuclear testing on 30 August 1961, and Soviet tests recommenced on 1 September, initiating a series of tests that included the detonation of Tsar Bomba. President John F. Kennedy responded by authorizing Operation Dominic. It was the largest nuclear weapons testing program ever conducted by the United States and the last atmospheric test series conducted by the U.S. as the limited test ban treaty was signed in Moscow the following year. Now, check this out. If you click on Operation Fishbowl, uh, we learn about Operation Fishbowl here. It was a series of high-altitude nuclear tests in 1962 that were carried out by the United States as part of the larger Operation Dominic nuclear test program. The Operation Fishbowl nuclear tests were originally planned to be completed during the first half of 1962, with three tests named Blue Gill, Starfish, and Araka. The first test attempt was delayed until June. Planning for Operation Fishbowl, what, as well as many other nuclear tests in the region, what, was begun rapidly in response to the sudden Soviet announcement on 30 August 1961 that they were ending a three-year moratorium on nuclear testing. The rapid planning of very complex operations necessitated many changes as the project progressed. All of the tests were to be launched on missiles from Johnston Island in the Pacific Ocean, north of the equator. Johnston Island had already been established as a launch site for United States high-altitude nuclear tests rather than the other locations in the Pacific Proving Grounds. In 1958, Louis Strauss, then chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, Opposed doing any high altitude tests at locations that had been used for earlier Pacific nuclear tests. His opposition was because of fears that the flash from the nighttime high altitude detonations might blind civilians who were living on nearby islands. Johnston Island was a remote location more distant from populated areas than other potential test locations. In order to protect residents of the Hawaiian Islands from flash blindness or permanent retinal injury from the bright nuclear flash, the nuclear missiles of Operation Fishbowl were launched generally toward the southwest of Johnston Island so that the detonations would be farther from Hawaii. Araka was to be a test of about one megaton yield at very high altitude, above a thousand kilometers. The proposed Araka test was always controversial, especially after the damage caused to satellites by the Starfish Prime detonation, as described below. Araka was finally canceled, and an extensive reevaluation of the Operation Fishbowl plan was made during an 82 day operations pause after the Blue Gill Prime disaster of 25 July 1962, as described below. Uh, and you could go on and read about Kingfish and all this stuff. Okay, so we got Operation Dominic, within which we have Operation Fishbowl. Now, with the tinfoil hat on, playing conspiracy theory here, the Flat Earthers are claiming, and and I think it's a reasonable claim, that you know if that model is true, then we know we have a circle, the circle of the Earth as described in the Bible, surrounded by... Antarctica, the outer rim, that has a two or three hundred foot uh, ice wall cliff that keeps everything in. Hence, Operation High Jump. You got to get over that, right? Uh, so it looks like, at least from the flat Earther perspective, that probably during Operation Deep Freeze, they may have found the edge of the dome, presumably anywhere from eight hundred to twelve hundred miles inland from the coast. Uh, then everybody pulls out, signs this treaty, says nobody can go back except under the express guidelines of the international community that signed the treaty. So then all of a sudden the United States and Russia engage in these high altitude nuclear tests. And the United States calls theirs Operation Dominic, within which we have Operation Fishbowl. Now, hold that thought. This is all happening. If you go and look uh, on the Operation Dominic uh, entry... You see the different dates, we're, we're, uh, 1962, this is the early part of 1962, we're talking May. I mean, look at all these bombs going off. 25 April 1962, 27 April, 2 May, 4 May, 6 May, 8 May, 
9 May, 11 May, 11 May, 12 May, 14 May, 19, etc., etc., etc. This is all before President Kennedy's let's go out in the space speech. But I, I think a lot of people don't realize that our first stop wasn't the moon. Even before we went to the moon, they were sending probes all of a sudden after all of this. Okay, keep the, keep the timeline in mind. Operation High Jump, Operation Deep Freeze, Bird Dives, NASA's founded, Antarctic Treaty signed, Operation Dominic and Fishbowl take effect. And if you notice during President Kennedy's speech, he was talking about that they've already got probes headed to Venus. And now if America's new spacecraft succeeds in reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars before midnight tonight. Wait a minute. We're already sending stuff to Venus and Mars? We haven't even been to the moon yet. And so I was looking into that. And on planetary.org forward slash explore forward slash space topics forward slash space missions forward slash missions missions to Venus dash Mercury dot HTML. And uh, you can go through this site. Uh, it starts sort of from the bottom up. As early as February 4th, 1961, they're sending a probe, Sputnik 7, the, uh, Russia sent this probe to check out Venus. The final stage of the rocket carrying Sputnik 7 into orbit failed and the spacecraft was unable to achieve the necessary trajectory to carry it onto Venus. Then Venera 1, Russia, sends out another probe uh, February 12, 1961. They lost uh, communications uh, while it was on its way to Venus. Then NASA sends up Mariner 1 July 22nd, 1962. Now that's right in the middle of Dominic and Fishbowl that they, we sent out a probe to go check out Venus. Um, it veered off course and was destroyed by ground controllers. So then Russia sends up another one, Sputnik 19, August 25th, 1962. The spacecraft made it into orbit, but the rocket's last stage failed as Sputnik 19 was unable to achieve its Venus trajectory uh, and re-entered the Earth's atmosphere three days later. NASA, August 27th, 1962. Uh, sends his probe. It says Mariner 2 was the first spacecraft to successfully fly by Venus at an altitude of 34,773 kilometers. The spacecraft discovered ground temperatures, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is during the time period that between August 27th, 1962 and December 14th, 1962, that we had President Kennedy's speech in September, on September 12th, 1962. So that's what he's referring to. You know, we've already got stuff out there <laughs> and you can read about the other ones that were, you know, checking out Venus, I guess Mercury also, and uh, attempted probes going to Mars. Now this is all before we've even been to the moon. So, it appears that whatever happened in Antarctica, everybody got kind of maybe nervous or excited or whatever and said, okay, what is the deal? You know, we've looked through telescopes. We've seen our so-called neighbors, uh, Venus and Mars, through telescopes. Our assumption is the solar system is, you know, set up in the Copernican model. And, um, but yet maybe, maybe they found a dome and they started to question all that. So the first thing they do is send out probes to go, wait a minute. What in the world? If this is if we're in a dome, how high does this thing go? So they start launching high altitude nuclear bombs, and if you look at the videos on Operation Fishbowl and Starfish Prime and all the, all those high altitude tests, I mean, it looks like they're hitting something up there. Um, that, I mean, at least from a conspiratorial tinfoil hat wearing perspective, that's what it looks like. Now, this is what blew my mind. You can read more on, on all that if you'd like. Um, to get caught up to speed on what's going on there. So I go to Lubbock and I'm doing this conference out there at uh, uh, Jared Cressman's uh, father's church, Dan, Pastor Dan Cressman. And uh, we get to talking about this whole issue of the flat earth stuff. And he goes, do you know what the name Dominic means? And I said, no. He says, you know, you talk about Operation Fishbowl, but check this out. I'm going to take you to... Um, I'll put the screen share back up here. Take you to a uh, one of those name websites. I like using behindthename.com. Look up the name Dominic. And again, let's just double check it here. 
Dominic, D-O-M-I-N-I-C. Look up Dominic, D-O-M-I-N-I-C. From the late Latin name Dominicus, meaning of the Lord. Fishball was part of Operation Dominic. It looks like they are sending high altitude nuclear bombs to test the fishbowl of the Lord. The firmament. <laughs> yeah. This is definitely one of those things to make you go, hmm. 